Last week we were wrapping up 1 Samuel 28, and we kind of ran through the last couple things uh, real quick at the end, so I uh, just wanted to kind of briefly recap those last few things. We know Saul went to the medium at Endor. Uh, she had to uh, kind of be persuaded that it was going to be okay to talk to Saul and to, she didn't know it was all the time. Uh, But Saul had previously run all of the mediums and necromancers out of Israel. Um, But he invokes the name of God to say, you know, don't worry, you're going to be safe. No harm is going to come to you. There will be no punishment for this. And when he asks to speak to Samuel, who has already died, the medium is quite surprised to see Samuel actually appear. So it it turns out that whatever the uh, Canaanite death ritual that they were used to would normally do, this was doing something quite different. I just saw it, just just to bring it up, because I saw it in a couple of places while I was studying that. A couple of commentators, sources that are usually pretty reliable, said it couldn't have been Samuel, but it had to be like a demon that came up that was disguised as Samuel. Simply by the way he came up out of the ground and the fact that a medium had called him and had God had not spoken or been willing to speak to Saul. Yeah. So I didn't know if you'd run across anything like that and what you thought about that. Um, I have run across people who um, believe that the mediums would normally have the kind of power, which I'm not sure I, I totally follow, that they would be able to do this uh, as much as they think they can. I don't necessarily find that super compelling, that that's a a demon that uh, is tricking Saul. Um, There's not really a problem with God making an exception here that he's not normally speaking to Saul, but now that he has gone this last step too far and his time of death is almost here, to speak through Samuel and to say, you're not going to get any help. And really, this still follows the pattern because Saul is asking for help. What do I do about the Philistines? And he doesn't get an answer to that. God doesn't tell him, you know, how to be successful against them or even whether he should go into battle against them or not. He simply says, you and your sons are going to die. Why, you know, stop asking these questions and stop trying to get these answers because your time is up. Uh, The... That, that's how I see that, mainly. It's kind of hard to, to see that being a demon to me, but um, whatever it is, Saul is not getting the answer he wants, uh, and he's not getting any real help from God. And that's the important part here. Yeah. So he... Yeah. That's a bit of a new one to me as well. But. Yeah. Well, this whole event here with the medium and Endor is obviously controversial. There's a lot of different ideas about what is happening here, uh, whether, and this, this kind of goes into what do you believe about the spirit realm in that, because uh, you, you've got some idea that uh, when people were worshiping idols, that sometimes they had demons responding to them and being responsible for some of what they thought were the gods helping them, but really being these evil spirits. That's a hard thing to prove. Um, and along the same lines, you have some people who believe that these, these Canaanites, as they're trying to call upon the dead, could be successful sometimes by using the power of demons. And that was not approved by God, and that was actually a very dangerous thing for them to be doing, uh, but that that is possibly what was happening. Like I said, I'm not 100% sure how compelling that is to me, uh, because she seems greatly surprised when Samuel or whoever it is appears. Uh, The fact that somebody responds is alarming to her and if you do this as a normal practice you wouldn't find that so surprising that's it's hard for me to get away from that um i there's the other reason why i don't think this is really a demon that is trying to deceive saul is what's the deceit here 
uh, because he's being told the truth. He's not being convinced to do anything that is evil or wrong. He's being given, as far as we can tell, an accurate message from God that God's not going to answer your questions anymore, which he's kind of already been told, and your reign is coming to an end. You and your sons are going to die. So if it's a demon pretending to be Samuel, the demon is giving an accurate telling of what's going on, which I suppose isn't impossible, but doesn't seem like the simplest answer. Okay. Uh, so uh, Saul's obviously very distressed at all of this. Uh, he uh, has to be coaxed even just to get up off the ground to have a bite to eat. Uh, and then we just see him go into battle as a doomed man, knowing that he's going to die. Um, but this is really the, the end of any like overt actions we see from Saul. All right, anything through the end of 28 you wanted to bring up? Questions or comments? Okay, so 29. So you will remember that David has gotten himself into a bind. He has been pretending to be the ally of Achish, uh, and we learn here that this is for a pretty lengthy period of time Achish says in verse 3 that he has been with him for days and years. So we're talking about more than just a few weeks that David has been keeping this ruse going for quite some time. Uh, and the, the exact mechanics of that, he's, been, he's kind of taken over this city of the Philistines, uh, Ziklag, and he had done that with the blessing of Achish. But he's going and raiding these other people who, uh, at least most, most or all of which God had judged and said that uh, they were devoted to destruction. But what he's telling Achish is something different, that I'm actually raiding the Israelites, the Hebrews. Uh, I have, have left Saul, I have left Israel, and now I am your ally, I am their enemy, and we can work together. And this has worked for an alarmingly long time that David uh, can, can keep the, the deception going. However, this has gone too far. He, it has worked too well in that David uh, has become so trusted by Achish that now Achish wants him to go into battle against Israel. And this is a little bit awkward because David has actually never raided the Israelites. He has never caused any kind of chaos in Israel. He's not interested in doing that. He doesn't want to fight against Saul. Every step of the way, we have seen David avoid fights with Saul uh, and try to just stay out of the way. Now, Achish is saying, come into battle with me, and you are so trusted, you are so treasured by me, that I want you to be uh, my bodyguard forever. So they're all assembling for war, and David doesn't have much choice but to assemble with them. So what do you think David's options here really are? Gary. Trust in God. Trust in God. And like I said last week, I, I would argue that David hasn't been doing a whole lot of trusting in God in the recent past, uh, that he's been coming up with his own schemes that he thinks are going to work. And while they have been very effective, they haven't really been ideal uh, for carrying out God's will or for protecting his reputation as being uh, the next king of Israel. Uh, he spent an awfully long time convincing Israel's enemies that he is their ally. Uh, and I don't think you can do that for literal years without that having some negative side effects. Uh, however, that is going to change some here in that David does rely some more on God. Uh, while it's implied a little more in 29, it becomes much more, more overt by the time we get to chapter 30. Uh, so, practically speaking, what can David do here as he's assembling for war against Israel? Yeah, Gary. Take complete advantage of the opportunity 
Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's, he's going to get bailed out, right? And that's kind of what question three is, is going to be about here. Uh, he gets providentially bailed out where he doesn't have to, uh, to really be put to the test all the way. Uh, but as far as David knows, at first, he's got to go into battle. He and his men will be marching out. So if that happens, what is David, like, what are his choices even, Aaron? Yes. And I believe that's what David intended to do here. Uh, I think it would be going way too far to say that David was really considering attacking Israel. He's had many opportunities to attack Israel if he wanted to. Uh, and that's, he, he's stayed very committed to the idea that he's the next king of Israel and that he doesn't actually want to go in battle against them. Uh, think about how much easier it would have been to convince Achish that he, you know, they are allies if he really did go raid Judah. And that's something he could have done, uh, but chose not to. So I don't think that we see David seriously considering attacking his own countrymen. Uh, so really his choices at this point boil down to flee the battle, which has its own assorted problems, uh, or use it as an opportunity to attack the Philistines from the rear uh, and, and betray them as these, uh, these other Philistine lords are afraid that David and his men will do. Uh, so I think that's probably what David was planning on. Um, Achish could not see that at all. But David gets providentially bailed out. How does he end up leaving the battle? Yeah. Yes, this is absolutely the best case scenario. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think you can see that some in the Bible that kind of in these, these matters of war that there's deception and that's not necessarily condemned. That's not necessarily the problem I have with David in this story that he's deceiving Achish, um, but more that he has this extended time where he's living among the Philistines, where he's away from Israel, where he is positioning himself as an enemy of Israel. And we talked about some mitigating factors to that last week that um, he, he, and we'll see it again here, that he sends some of the spoils to Judah in showing them, hey, I'm on your side. I, uh, you know, I really am still an Israelite and loyal to God and loyal to you. So there are some mitigating factors to that. Um, but still, I think you can see that God is upset about something. So whether it's God being upset about some of the raids that David was doing, which we have at least one group of people there that we can't identify, so we don't know if David was justified in doing that or not, uh, or something about the deception, or something about David choosing to be in the land of the Philistines for this long, when he could have continued to do what he did before, which was, you know, stay in the wilderness and stay on the outskirts of things and just stay away from Saul as much as possible, there was nothing that forced David to be in the land of the Philistines, particularly for this long. Uh, and God's upset about something here because of what ends up happening, uh, and we have to grapple with that somehow. Uh, nevertheless, David is providentially bailed out here because God is committed to David's success 
Uh, David is going to be the next king. It is probably for the best that David is not seen assembling with the Philistines in battle against the Israelites, uh, that there is no opportunity for any of David's men to really be fighting against Israel. And so what ends up happening here is as they're assembling for battle, some of these other Philistine lords uh, say, why are there Hebrews in our army? We're not fighting with Hebrews, we're fighting against Hebrews. Uh, and we don't want them here with us. Of course, Achish is totally swept up in, in David's you know, deception here, totally believes that David is loyal. And uh, he says, uh, is this not David, the servant of Saul, king of Israel, who has been with me now for days and years, and since he deserted to me, I have found no fault in him to this day. So he can't be convinced that there's any problem. He, he sees David as a trusted friend and ally. But the commanders of the Philistines are not okay with this at all. Uh, they're, they're angry and they say, send him back that he may return to the place to which you have assigned him. He shall not go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he become an adversary to us. For how could this fellow reconcile himself to his Lord? Would it not be with the heads of the men here? Is not this David, of whom they sing to one another in dances, Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands? And you know, they've got a point. <laughs> David has killed an awful lot of Philistines over the years, and if he is looking to make a move to get back to Israel, uh, to get back in the good graces of Saul, which is what the Philistines imagine that David could be doing, what better way to do that than to completely undercut this whole battle and to kill many thousands more Philistines? And even if that's not what David intends, he's got these hundreds of men with him, who's to say that they're all going to hold firm in battle against their own countrymen? Uh, this is something that they've already seen before. Uh, in 1 Samuel 14, 21, there were some Hebrews who had defected over to the Philistines, and then they defect back once the Israelites are having some success. So, 1 Samuel 14, 21, Now the Hebrews who had been with the Philistines before that time and who had gone up with them into the camp, even they also turned to be with the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. So, they have already experienced the danger of having Hebrews among you and assuming that they're going to be loyal. These men cannot be trusted. David cannot be trusted. We need to keep them far away from us and far away from this battle if we're going to have any success. Uh, and Achish is just, he totally doesn't get it. He doesn't see any danger at all here. Uh, and he, he wishes that it didn't have to be this way, but he's going to have a revolt on his hands and they've got to be united if they're going to go into battle. Um, so, the way that Achish says this to David, I, I find this whole conversation amusing here, because Achish is so apologetic. In verse 6, he says, uh, As the Lord lives, you have been honest, and to me it seems right that you should march out and in with me in the campaign, for I have found nothing wrong in you from the day of your coming to me this day. Nevertheless, the lords do not approve of you, so go back now and go peaceably, that you may not displease the lords of the Philistines. But, and David said to Achish, what, But what have I done? What have you found in your servant uh, from the day I entered your service until now, that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? And Achish answered David and said, I know that you are as blameless in my sight as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the commanders of the Philistines have said, He shall not go up with us to the battle. And then he dismisses David and his men. So Achish is apologetic and almost embarrassed to be telling David this because he really wants him to, to fight side by side with him. And David pretends to be so shocked and hurt of, I was really looking forward to this. I really wanted to be in this battle. Although you will note that the very specific way that David words this 
is uh, that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king. Who is David talking about there? He obviously wants Achish to interpret that as fighting against your enemies. But does David really recognize Achish as being his lord and king? Obviously not. So he has still upheld Saul as being the Lord's anointed, of being the king of Israel, and the Philistines are the enemy. So this is why I think that David's intent was not to flee the battle and see if they could just get away, but as Aaron was saying before, uh, that he would use this as an opportunity uh, to, to switch sides in the battle and to attack the Philistines from the rear. Uh, so that's all fine and good, and maybe that could have worked out okay, but David's not going to be in this battle. He will have nothing to do with it, uh, and it will be time for him and his men to leave. We will talk more about this battle later, but for now we are moving on past the battle uh, to see what David and his men are up to as they start to head home. But is there anything else you wanted to mention about this event or this battle before we move on? Yeah, David had been in a battle that killed history would have been changed. Yeah. Sure. And, I, I, you know, God's not going to let David be killed. David's been in plenty of battles before. Uh, he was in a uh, battle against Goliath. He was in battle against armies of Philistines before, armies of other people as well. David has been preserved, and God absolutely could have preserved David in this battle, too. It's not that David couldn't go to war. He's done it so much, and he's going to do it again. Uh, in fact, we're, we'll get ready to see David fighting some more. I think probably more of the problem is how damaging is it going to be to David's prospects as the next king to be seen lined up with the Philistines. Even if he turns against the Philistines in that battle, there are always going to be some people among Israel who will say, we went out into battle, and David and his men were against us. Is he really for us, or was he playing both sides and looking to see, to, to join whoever he thought was stronger? Uh, that has been taken away, probably for the better. Tom, did you have a... Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, uh, it's interesting how Akish says, I know that you are as good in my sight as the angel of God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, remember that the Philistines like, would have acknowledged the existence of Yahweh. They, they definitely believed that the God of the Israelites existed. Uh, and they didn't necessarily worship Yahweh, of course, but, but would have believed that he existed and believed that he had power, believed that, that he would do things for his people. Um, you know, Achish saying, I know that you are like a messenger that comes from your God, or that comes from the gods, maybe. But he knows that David worships another God. He doesn't necessarily have a problem with that. Um, but this is a way of complimenting David and a way of acknowledging David's moral purity here, right? His status uh, as, as being... Uh, treasured by his God and being blessed by his God. Uh, ironic that David has been deceiving Achish this whole time, although maybe justifiably. Yeah, Mark. Thank you. 
Yeah. You know, it was just this common thing that they did. They were terrorists. Yeah. And David just uses his humility to get into the graces of this guy, who's a complete terrorist. Yeah. And this guy, this this is the same guy who's the, he was the king over Goliath. Yeah. This is the same territory, and it's just I mean we don't see the providence of God. I think he missed the whole thing. Right. <laughs> Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and really, this battle is going to be used to bring about the deaths of Saul and Jonathan, you know, Saul's children, right? So you actually kind of need Israel to lose for God's plan to be accomplished here. Uh, and so it's really not good for David to be here on any level for what the Israelites are going to see, or even if he is successful and if God is going to be with him and, and give him this great victory. It's actually not what needs to happen right now uh, because it, it's time for Saul and his sons to die. So David just needs to be removed from this situation entirely, which is what happens. Uh, God providentially pulls him out of this. Uh, but also, there's another level to this. God still has something to teach David. David is not just being pulled away from this and kind of put in a corner somewhere to wait until it's time. There is a problem, and God needs to show David uh, that he needs to rely on him. Uh, and that's what chapter 30 is going to be about. Uh, as we see David make a shift in the, the kind of uh, reliance that he has on God and trust he has in God. Okay, last call on anything in 29. Okay, 30. So, uh, David and his men have been dismissed. They head back to Ziklag. That's the, the town that they were given uh, and where they all lived, where their families were staying while they went out to war. And when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them, they carried them off and went their way. Uh-oh, <laughs> that's, that's not good. Uh, and it comes maybe a as a surprise here if, if you want to justify everything that David has been doing. And it's this chapter that really convinces me that David's actions up to this point have not been completely pure and completely uh, uh, accepted by God. Uh, we can talk about mitigating factors, we can talk about the effectiveness, we can talk about David being in a bit of a bind and trying to make the best of a situation, but something that David has done in all of this has not been pleasing to God because there is a judgment against him here. Aaron. And uh, where does it say that God is judgment from God? So it doesn't say that. Um, yet we're left asking... If God has kept David safe for so long and kept his family safe and kept his men safe, why are they coming back and finding that all of their families have been taken captive? What has changed to let this terrible tragedy happen to David and his men? No one's been killed. No one's been killed. That's the hand of God right there. There's some mercy in this judgment, too, that no one has been killed. And by the end of it, they're going to recover all of them. But you, if you put the pieces together from the fact that it, all of chapter 28 and 29, David has not been uh, inquiring of God as to what he should do. And then he is providentially taken out of this battle. He comes back and finds this whole disaster that has come, and David's response to all of this, what he thinks he needs to do to fix it, is to start inquiring of God again. 
and then, then everything gets better. To me, that says, if inquiring of God was the solution, then what was the problem before? And maybe it's as simple as David had not been inquiring of God in any of this. Maybe God would have wanted him to do some of these things that he was doing, that some of those would have been the right plan or would have been justifiable, but we haven't seen David asking anything of God, and we see a, a problem here where David's attention is grabbed very severely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it got very serious here. Um, when they see this, they have the, the response that you would expect. They weep until they had no more strength to weep. And David's wives have been captured as well. They're included in this number. He, David's not been protected any more than any of the other people were. Uh, and David is greatly distressed, and the people are greatly distressed, and they're talking about stoning David. What kind of leader is this, that he got all of our families captured? And as far as they know, they're dead. No, we know they're not. But they don't know that. As far as they know, they have been killed, or they're going to be kept as slaves or sold as slaves or something. It doesn't really matter. This is a terrible tragedy that has happened. Our children and our wives are gone, and now we just have this fool David who's leading us into destruction. We narrowly escaped having to go into battle against Israel, you can just imagine them saying, and now look at what has happened. So they were bitter in soul, but our, our hinge verse here, the, the foundational verse that is so important to understanding this, is verse 6 at the end where it says, But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. So there's a contrast being drawn between David and Saul. We've seen Saul in a few desperate situations before. What did Saul do earlier on when the Philistines were coming to attack, when uh, they were hiding, and when they, they all believed that they were going to die? Do you remember that time of what Saul did? There were a few things like that, so. And in and, and that, sorry, Steve, were you? In the time I'm thinking of, and I realize this is a little vague because there were several things like this. In the time I'm thinking of, uh, Saul was paralyzed with fear. He did nothing. And then he thought, well, maybe I should inquire of God. And he started to do that. And then he thought better of it and said, well, maybe we'll go into battle or maybe we'll do nothing. And, he's, and the way that ended was... Jonathan just left and went into battle against the Philistines. It was Jonathan and his armor bearer who found success while Saul was sitting there frozen, not knowing what to do. So in that case, where Saul was backed into a corner, he froze. In this most recent case, where Saul is in great distress, where he sees the Philistines assembling uh, for war, and he goes to the medium at Endor, he has, has also not relied on God very well. He's looking for a solution to his problem. He knows God is not answering him. And so he's going to try to use the, these pagan practices, this necromancy, to try to talk to Samuel. So Saul gets more and more desperate and relies on either freezing or bizarre decisions to make things better. And to be fair, sometimes David relies on some pretty bizarre decisions to make things better. Now, he's not always been justified in everything he's done. He's had to be corrected at different times. He lied to the priests at Nob. Uh, he uh, almost attacked Nabal and his servants. Uh, here he spent an awfully long time in the land of the Philistines, uh, becoming a friend and ally to them which seems troubling at best. 
But the difference between Saul and David is Saul just continues plunging downwards. Saul always gets worse. David actually learns something from these events. So when he lied to the priests at Nob, he uh, realized that he had done wrong and he took responsibility for it. And he, he kept that, that remaining priest, who, Abiathar, who had escaped and said, you know, your enemies are my enemies, stay with me and I'll protect you. Uh, when he uh, had, uh, when he was uh, going to attack Nabal and Abigail interceded and said, don't do this, don't bring blood guilt on you, David could listen to reason and could realize she's right. You know how few people are able to do that when they're in fury and rage and feel they've been wronged, and, and in this case really have been wronged, uh, and have decided to seek vengeance? Not too many people would actually be able to be dissuaded from that vengeance and to make a better choice, but David could. And here in this situation, where David has spent a long time away from Israel, a long time play-acting as an ally of the Philistines, and now when he sees that there are consequences, his solution is to strengthen himself in the Lord his God. So that's the pattern that we're meant to see out of David. Uh, and that's the, the more important comparison. Rather than just looking at any one event and trying to say, was David right or wrong, you're meant to compare Saul and David and see the difference. Saul just gets worse. David learns from his mistakes. He repents. He draws closer to God. And he, uh, he, he you know, becomes stronger by the end of it. So that's a pattern that we will continue to see throughout David's life. It's what makes him a man after God's own heart. It's not perfection. It's not that everything he did was good. It's that he was constantly seeking God and looking to learn. Cool? Makes sense? Okay, so now for the first time in quite some time, we see David inquiring of God. And I keep harping on this because it's significant. We've seen David make a, a bunch of decisions that are hard to understand, and it's only now, after this tragedy that has struck, that he decides to inquire of God. And so he calls Abiathar, says, bring the ephod, uh, and he inquires of God, saying, shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? So he's asking God, you know, is this your judgment that they've been taken from us and we're not going to get them back? Because if he's only concerned with trying, he would have just gone and tried. But if God says, no, do not pursue after them, this is my judgment against you, then I think we would have seen David respect that, even though that probably would have made it all the harder for him to lead the people. But God says, pursue, for you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue. And so David and 600 men uh, go to pursue after the Amalekites. And we're going to see God's mercy in this, that God has not allowed any of these people to die, that God is going to uh, allow for a total rescue, a total restoration of all the people and all the spoils that they lost and more. Uh, but there's still some events along the way. So they get uh, to the brook Bezor, and uh, 200 of the men were too exhausted to continue. And so they leave 200 men there with some of the baggage, uh, and now it's David and 400 men. That might seem like a strange detail to put in there. It becomes relevant at the end of the battle as you have some men who actually fought and some who stayed behind, only able to go part way. So what do they find in, uh, after this out there in the open country? They find an Egyptian. And uh, he is seemingly on the brink of death here. He's hungry and thirsty, and he's been uh, out on his own for three days and three nights. He has not eaten or had any water uh, for that long, so he's in dire straits. 
And David and his men show him some kindness. They give him water, give him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins, uh, kind of treat him well and get him in better shape to be able to talk. Uh, and of course, they want to get some information out of him. Who are you? And do you know anything that might be useful to us? Uh, so he tells them that he's a servant of an Amalekite. Uh, he had been left behind because he had fallen sick three days ago. So you've got a sick man who now has had three days with no food and water. No wonder he was on the brink of death. Uh, and he, he says, we had just made this raid against Judah, uh, and we burned Ziklag with fire. So this is very relevant. They've got a lead. And David says, will you take me uh, to, to meet up with this band of Amalekites? And of course, the Egyptian servant is very interested in preserving his own life and saying, well, don't turn me over to them. <laughs> don't kill me if I do this. I'll help you, but, you know, like, do me a favor here. Uh, and of course, they agree to that. Uh, but it is nice to see David showing some kindness here. They actually do treat this servant pretty well. Uh, they could have just tortured the information out of him or, uh, you know, asked him very sternly and then beaten him up and, you know, leaving him there to die. But instead, they actually do um, feed him quite nicely and treat him very well. Uh, and they're able to get a, a good answer from him as a result. Uh, okay, let's see here. So they go a little farther. And I've rearranged the questions here a little bit because they seemed out of order to me. Um, but question five asks, what is ironic about David defeating the Amalekites in chapter 30? Uh, they come across the Amalekites here. They see them all dancing and feasting and celebrating because they've had a great deal of success lately. And they go and attack the Amalekites. And what happens? Are they successful? Are they very successful? <laughs> they are completely successful in every way, right? They, uh, they attack from twilight all the way until the evening of the next day. So you've got that 24-hour bloodbath there. Um, and only 400 of the Amalekites were able to escape, uh, who were able to get onto some camels and flee. Um, but David was able to recover all that the Amalekites had taken, and he rescued his two wives. It says nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought back all. David also captured all the flocks and herds, and the people drove the livestock before him and said, this is David's spoil. So total restoration. Not a single person had been killed. Uh, not a single bit of spoil had been lost. Uh, even those 400 people who got away uh, were not able to take anything with them. They were not able to take any of that spoil or take any of these captives with them. Uh, so as far as David and his men are concerned, like this is a great success. Uh, and I do think we need to recognize the providence of God here. And even if David is is being judged, punished, reminded, some sort of combination of those things, um, that God has still kept these people safe and has not allowed any of them to die. Uh, that a lesson is going to be learned from this, but it's going to end up okay in the end. Uh, and the people seem to be much happier with David by this point. Uh, that we have found success, God has not abandoned him after all, and maybe David is a good leader. So what's ironic about David doing this? Yeah. 
Yeah. So, yeah, it's we're going to share the spoils with everyone, even those who were too exhausted to come all the way. This is pretty uh, merciful of David and, and definitely helping everyone out here. Um, I do think the way that these, these soldiers spoke was surprisingly harsh, uh, that they were saying, we don't want to share anything with these other people. And you might understand why they think that way. You know, we fought and they didn't. But I, it's, it's harsh to me that they're like, well, you know, I guess we'll let them have their wives and children back. <laughs> like, you know, we'll be, we'll be so kind as to give them back to them, but, but we want the spoils. And I'm like, ouch, <laughs> that's, that's pretty rough. Gary? Absolutely. Um, this was, was not a good look for them, and David rightly nips this in the bud. He says, no, this is a celebration and a victory for all of us, uh, not just the ones who are in battle. Yeah. So that's the other comparison that needs to be made here, that Saul, in chapter 15, was not willing to obey God in totally wiping out the Amalekites, so they shouldn't have even still been here, right? But they are, because Saul failed. And we see David willing to do what Saul was not. So once again, you're supposed to see David as a better manifestation of obedience than Saul ever really was. Okay, thanks everyone. Next week we will continue on. Uh, we have a couple more things we can talk about in chapter 30, but then mostly we'll 31 and maybe kind of review some things. Thanks.